Welcome to the new normal. High inflation, higher rates, slowing growth, the end of cheap money. Add to that rising uncertainties, the looming recession, the banking turmoil, which some say has yet to play out fully. And of course, we had the debt ceiling issue in the US. All this coming on the back of a brutal 2022 where stocks and bonds lost something like $30 trillion. They say brace for more vol ahead. Rohit, let's start with you. How much more difficult is it to make money now? Well, it's a tough environment. Uh, let's take the US, for example. You've got the market pricing in 75 basis points of rate cuts by the end of the year. And at the same time, earnings are expected to rebound and accelerate upwards from negative right now in Q2 to plus 9% in Q4. Now, the Fed cutting rates when you have a reacceleration in earnings at a time when core inflation is close to 5%, it just doesn't add up. So today, uh, the S&P is trading at about over 18 times earnings with real rates at 1.4%, almost 1.5% right now. In the decade before 2020, uh, average multiples of 15x with real rates at 0.4%. So, you know, it's, it doesn't add up. I mean, there is definitely much more downside. And from a risk reward perspective, uh, very difficult to sort of take a positive stance there. Talking about not adding up, Ken, I mean, we started the year saying it's going to be a tale of two halves. A more difficult first half, a better second half. It doesn't feel like it. It doesn't add up. Well, as I said, it, it's a rolling half. We just keep moving that half further away. And I do think the banking crisis uh, somewhat got in the way of what felt like a bit of a recovery in the first quarter. Um, and to Rohit's point, the markets, you know, I think there's a big difference between the economy and the markets. The economy, I think, still has a rough time ahead of it. But it's the job of the markets to look ahead. And, uh, you know, the, the markets have sort of been in a, in a funk for 15 or 16 months already. And I, and I think they're... They're itching to look beyond the, the nine to 12 months that we might have a bad economy, but the markets are gonna to try to anticipate that and get ahead of it. The banking crisis, some say it'll take years to fully play out, do you agree? Yes, because I, I, this will result in tremendous new legislation and regulation. You know, the banking crisis was almost, it, look, it happens every 10 or 15 years, it just happens differently. But the, the banks are under, you know, we have a strong system, but they still levered seven or eight to one. By definition, a bank is levered seven or eight to one. And um, these, these, the, the speed with which deposits can leave now is a real problem. So it was funny, in the last crisis, I told my kids, this was 2009, I said, look, if, if I get hit by a bus, just remember one thing in life, never borrow short-term to invest long term. I said, that's it. My 13 year old daughter would say, I don't know what that means. I said, you don't have to know it now. Just remember that. And, and, and that's the heart of all these problems. You can't have deposits that can leave in a half hour and invest in assets that are of duration. And that's going to be a real problem. So what are the implications for the US and the international banking system then? So look, at right now, you're seeing a tightening in credit across most developed markets. I mean, you've had uh, the recent bank lending survey in Europe, ECB bank lending survey, had credit conditions with the tightest you've seen since the GFC. Uh, similarly, uh, the loan officer survey in, in, in the US showed sort of similar characteristics. And they're at levels usually you would associate in ahead of a recession. So, you know, I, ultimately, this is a cyclical thing. You know, we've got an overheated economy, inflation that's sort of struggling to come down. It's coming down, but it's still elevated, and there's no real sign of it getting to the Fed's 2% target. So in my view, a lot of this is cyclical, but we have to go through the pain to create the slack in the economy to get inflation back under control. Um, and we do think it won't be a severe recession, just because the starting point in terms of household balance sheets, bank balance sheets, corporate balance sheets, are much better than we've seen in terms of the bad recessions. Of course, we had Secretary Mnuchin saying that there is a 50-50 chance of a recession in the U.S. Pretty non-committal. Ken, do you agree? I, I can't see how we don't have a recession. Um, these rates, remember a year ago when they started to raise rates, you only had to pay like a, very, a quarter of 50 basis point increase. 
We're now at the point where you have to pay a full year of a 500 basis point increase or a 400 basis point increase. So it's a slow moving, uh, eating away at the profits. But you know, again, I, I think the economy has worse to go, but I think the markets have been anticipating this for a while. So we've been talking about the risks. Let me just add one more, the debt ceiling. Of course, I mean, maybe a resolution will come soon, maybe not. Is there a sense that we are concerned about a possible default and what that would mean for markets? You know, it's, it's, it's a difficult one to sort of expect a default. You've seen this movie play out so many times before. It goes to the wire but and then you have some resolution. But something's much worse this time round. Look, I, I personally feel they'll get to a resolution. It will, you'll get to the wire and then there will be a resolution. So I'm not that concerned about this issue. Even if there's a default, there will probably be, you know, quick corrections out there. It's not something that's going to be a steady state going forward. So most, I'm more actually concerned about more structural issues that we are seeing in the global economy, particularly around geopolitics and tensions of the kind that you haven't seen in the last few decades, and the implications of that on a lot of businesses, economies, and how we invest. Ken? Yeah, I agree with Rohit. This is, um, it's a great made-for-TV uh, drama. <laughs> um, you, you know, maybe it's the M&A banker in me, but no deal ever happens until each party walks out at least once. And you, you, we just don't cover that. We're covering that on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, but you know, I, th I think it'll be behind us soon. Mm. Ro Rohit talked about geopolitics. You have to talk about China, U.S.-China in particular. They're bickering over just about everything. Is China too risky to invest right now? We know that when we had this conversation about a year ago, you were predicting that China would recover in terms of its economy in the second half of last year, but yet we saw the CSI 300 index get dumped down 14%, the Hong, Hong Seng Index was also down about 10% thereabouts, and here we are, China is um, looking pretty weak. So the basis for the recovery was that they would get out of COVID and the economy would open up and consumption would recover. You know, through this process, you also had you know, the elections, everything else, the new president, I guess the renewal of the presidency, et cetera, and there were a lot of concerns around the global economy as well as in China. You saw the opening of COVID, took longer, but in the first quarter of this year, you saw a sharp recovery in consumption, and the expectation was that that would continue into the second quarter. Now, what surprised everyone is that it hasn't. It's actually slowed down again. So look, at the end of the day, uh, it is critical for the party out there to drive growth, and the only channel for growth this year is really going to be consumption. So I think it will ultimately happen, but timing is uncertain. Um, the more important part is in terms of capital flows and what happens to the markets. And that will be driven by domestic capital flows. It's not going to be driven by foreign capital flows. And on that front, I think it's a question of consumer confidence. Savings rates have gone up. Normally, that money would have gone into property. It's not going to go into property right now. If you see that confidence come back, it will move into the domestic market. Uh, you know, you've had the HSI had three consecutive years of negative returns. You've never in history had four consecutive years of negative returns. Um, so this time may be different. But I do think you're starting off MSCI China trading at well below average multiples. You should see a cyclical recovery in earnings. So the question is, look, do you have a modest growth in the market this year? Or do you have you know, a sharp overture to the upside? You know, that, that's what I would start with from a tactical and cyclical perspective. I mean, that's how I would sort of think about it. The American perspective? Well, I'll give you my perspective because I think it's contra to American perspective. I think America uh, made a tremendous mistake um, using weaponizing business and capital flows as a result of this war. I think they've, they've put a risk, and by the way, I compliment the region's approach to this. This region um, has acted exceptionally, I think, it, it, smartly. Uh, but I think we've put in a risk now, a political risk on your capital investments that that is digital, what happens if I need to exit? And I think that's gonna have a long-term ramification for investment in certain uh, politically hot areas where China is right now. And um, I, you know, I think that's a problem. The thing is, can you afford not to be in China? Well, I think there's a lot of boardrooms in the world now asking, can we afford to be in China? Can we afford, if somebody tells us we have to walk away from our asset base, how much asset base do we want to have? What can we afford to leave behind if a political uh, confrontation 
I, I don't think that, you know, I don't remember that being on the agenda in my first 30 years in, in this industry, and now it's definitely a conversation. Definitely more, definitely a very strong U.S. perspective. Elsewhere, too, people have to consider that risk. But I think people are trying to balance it in saying, you know, this is the second largest economy in the world. It's the largest trading partner to 140 countries. In fact, even Europe, in the European Parliament, uh, the EU president sort of said that it's neither viable nor desirable to decouple with China. I mean, the world can't just cut itself off from China. Having said that, there will be a lot of sectors where uh, it's got to be exposed because of these US-China tensions. So really, it's investable, but particularly in China for China, or businesses that are self-contained within the China economic sphere of influence. The markets in China, the supply chain, the technology, you're not dependent on the West. And there are a lot of sectors where that holds true for China. So I think you have to be selective where you invest in China. There definitely will be opportunities. The question is, where is investable? If you take a look at the crackdown, they went from tech to property to now consultancy. If you take a look at the filings of Tomasek, Rohit, I mean, you guys have been buying Baba, JD.com. Is there a sense that they're buys now, or do you, like you said, have to be pretty specific in terms of what you buy in China? So as I said, you've got to be policy aligned and you've got to be out of the crosshairs of US-China tensions. So actually the areas that are most exciting to us for China right now are things around sustainability, so EVs, batteries, solar, wind, that sort of stuff. Uh, China is dominant and it's very policy aligned. Areas like biotech, which earlier we would have looked at the domestic opportunity, but also looked at the opportunity in other markets, in Western markets. Now you've got to underwrite it based on the domestic market opportunity, which is also very big. And you've got to just, that's the only shift you've got to make. Or in general consumption, whether discretionary or staples, et cetera, which are policy neutral, and, uh, and China's a big market. So those are the areas which we are most focused on, uh, because, um, and again, as I said, it's the, from capital flow perspective, it's going to be domestic capital flows which are going to drive it. Uh, I don't think you can rely on U.S. capital flows, for example, to uh, come in any significant way into China. What looks attractive? You take a 12, 24, 36-month perspective in China. Yeah, yes, you can. But you still, you know, if you're, if you're in, let's say, a U.S.-China investment program and you're thinking about it, you have to wonder over that time frame, will there be an event that causes that the a public outcry, governmental intervention, causes you to have to walk away from that investment. And it's very hard to make your money back in 36 months. I mean, you, you know, most investments have a long term, and, and, and that's a real risk right now. And, and by the way, it might be a one in five chance that it happens, but that's a significant, look at, look at the assets that, um, private assets uh, that, were, that had to be uh, forsaken uh, and, and left behind as a result of a political uh, confrontation. You know, the speakers before us keep talking about the opportunities in the Gulf area, in the Gulf states. They used to be the source of capital. Now they have become a very attractive investment destination themselves. What's your take on it? What's contributing to that? What's looking good? Almost everything. When I come here, it's so energized. And I know, I was going to say, the, the real asset of the Gulf is energy, and I don't mean energy in the ground, I mean the energy of the people. The, 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 the region has thought long term. It has invested in talent, in infrastructure. Um, the decision making is crisp and it's clean. The, 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 uh, the ability to uh, get workforce in here, the fact that there's, uh, you don't have to, as a business, you don't have to deal with the union uh, problems. Um, I think the region has so much going for it in terms of their ability to make decisions, operate quickly, cut through the red tape, and lastly, think long term. This is, this is one of the few places in the world that's actually making investments for five to ten years. They're not huddled in, a, in the White House trying to figure out if they're going to pay the debts next week. They're thinking, how do we make the country rich ten years from now? How do we make our people better off? It's, it's, it's invigorating to be here. <laughs> Ken says, think long-term, Tomasek, a long-term investor. Look, I think uh, from our perspective, you know, you talked about risks in China, risks elsewhere, et cetera. I think you have to have uh, a balanced portfolio which can actually do well across most environments or not be unduly exposed to a particular environment. 
Um, you know, the Middle East clearly is uh, an emerging area where there's a lot of energy, growth, et cetera, and uh, we need to look to see what opportunities we can sort of see out here. But it's in, it has to be in the context of a global portfolio and the balance. So, you know, I just want to come back to this point you made about China and the risk there. I mean, clearly there are risks, but when we do the scenario planning, there is also upside scenarios for China. So you can't have a portfolio that just completely avoids China, just like you cannot have a portfolio that avoids the US or Europe, or in fact now increasingly, I would say, the Middle East. So I think that's how we try and look at a portfolio which is more balanced, and I definitely agree with Ken that there's a lot of energy out here, and this is one of the fastest growing regions. Um, also, I would say regions that are relatively not in the, either the US or the China camp uh, will benefit in this geopolitical environment. So that's Southeast Asia, India, the Middle East are all, I think, going to be beneficiaries of that. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering and curious about India. People always talk about India being the alternative to China, but there are also questions about the scale compared to China. I mean, if you take a look at the private equity market, for instance, is it ready to absorb the capital that is being diverted, rotated out of China? I don't think it can be a substitute for China in the near term. I mean, China is five times the size of India in terms of the size of the economy. Having said that, both from a structural and cyclical perspective, uh, India is looking very good right now. From a structural perspective, this China plus one strategy, India will form part of the alternative out there. There's been a lot of in investment in infrastructure and other areas in the last few years, which is positioning India for growth. On a cyclical perspective, PMIs are at the highest levels you've seen in the last decade. Credit growth is strong. So it is an attractive market, and we would want to sort of do more and increase our share in that market of our portfolio. But you've got to be calibrated to how much you can do. I mean, you've got to be realistic that it's not just going to be a substitute for China, but it'll be one of the areas where you'll see more money flow in. Cam, thoughts on India? Yeah, look, India sh should be the greatest economy in the world. Uh, you know, they, they, if they get out of their own way bureaucratically. You look at the United States now, I think, I, I don't have it exactly, but six or seven of the largest companies in America are run by Indian trained and uh, in, Indian business people. The, the, the difficulty with India is those people are in America. <laughs> and and if, uh, if they could get their, if they could get to decision making, get the bureaucracy out of the way, it should be exactly what you said, and they just have to solve that. Quickly running out of time, I just want to touch on crypto. Uh, it's gone from a crypto winter to the ice age, uh, where it's lost a lot of money there. What are the chances of a recovery? How are you looking at it? Is it a sideshow? Will it make a full recovery if we have regulation? How are you looking at it? Well, we, we actually started a blockchain crypto uh, group within our own firm because we think Whatever happens, um, and, and I don't know the answer to that, but I know there is a whole generation that's tremendously interested in making it work and is committed to making it work at a system, um, and our job there will be to try to help them. We've been involved in almost all the restructurings, <laughs> so so far it's been a, a lot of cleanup around some of the uh, projects that haven't worked, but who knows? I, I never underestimate the... Uh, the energy and the, and the creativity of, of this generation. So I, I think it's going to have cycles, and, and we'll see where it goes. Is there still appetite? I mean, I think, the market was badly hit. You know, to your point, uh, I think regulation is going to be key. Because in the absence of regulation, it's too volatile an asset to be a store of value. So I think we just have to see how regulations sort of come out and what that means for this asset class in the longer term. But some say it's not a good fit for institutional investors. I mean, right now, in the absence of regulation, given all the uncertainty, there's no fundamental value to these cryptocurrencies. Um, it clearly, it's very difficult for uh, institutional investors to invest in the currencies as such. Around blockchain applications, which are much beyond just the currencies, I mean, yes, I think that could be an area for investment for institutional investors, you know, where you find the right uh, business opportunities. On that cautious note, we wrap up this discussion. Ken, Rohit, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having us. Thank you.